going to go ahead and get started here with our third panel. This panel is going to focus on the judicial power. Uh, our moderator for this panel is Judge Ben Beaton, who is a United States District Judge in the Western District of Kentucky. Judge Beaton is a lifelong Kentuckian, a graduate of Center College uh, and Columbia Law School. He clerked for Judge Raymond, oh, clapping for Columbia. Uh, he clerked for Judge Raymond Randolph on the DC Circuit and for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, he also worked in private practice before his appointment to the bench in 2020. Uh, joining him on the panel is Professor Gary Lawson, the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor of Law at Boston University Law School. Uh, as, as some of you are doubtless aware, he's on his way to a sunnier location soon, uh, the University of Florida. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, he teaches and writes mainly in the areas of administrative law and constitutional law. He's a graduate of Claremont Men's College and Yale Law School, and he clerked for Judge and then Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, we also have Professor John Harrison, the James Monroe, excuse me, the James Madison, not to be confused with James Monroe, the James Madison Distinguished Professor uh, of Law at the University of Virginia. Professor Harrison previously worked at the Department of Justice, including in the OLC during the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, he's a prolific scholar of public and of private law. He's a graduate of UVA and of Yale Law School. We also have uh, Professor Jeannie Sook Gerson, the John H. Watson Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School. Professor Gerson teaches in the areas of constitutional law, uh, family law, and criminal law, all of which are also uh, part of her scholarship, which also includes writing in The New Yorker, uh, including a recent piece about judicial supremacy that many of you uh, may have seen last year that focused on Jonathan Mitchell. Uh, Professor Gerson is a graduate of Yale, of Oxford, and of Harvard Law School, uh, and she clerked for Judge Harry Edwards on the DC Circuit, as well as Justice David Souter. And last but not least, we have Professor Amanda Tyler. Professor Tyler is the Shannon C. Turner Professor of Law at UC Berkeley. Uh, Professor Tyler Tyler taught previously at GW. She's a scholar of federal courts, criminal procedure, national security, and civil procedure, which is another way of saying habeas. Uh, um, <laughs> she's a graduate of Stanford University uh, and of Harvard Law School. She clerked for Judge Guido Calabrese on the Second Circuit and for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as well. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Judge Beaton, as we've been doing all day. Uh, as once this panel reaches a certain point, we will take your questions. Please raise your hand and just wait for the microphone to reach you before you ask your question. Judge Beaton? All right, thank you, Ben, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope, Ben, you work just as hard as editing opinions next year as you do polishing those bios for today. Well done. Uh, we have sorted you all out into the future practitioners and the future professors uh, of the world, and now we are bringing you all back together, back to school, as it were, and to be specific, to Fed Court's class for this panel on judicial power and evaluating judicial supremacy. Um, it is with great delight and some trepidation uh, that I'm moderating this panel of heavyweight academics. Uh, I understand, and I'm sure you do as well, why Ben Ponce originally wanted Professor Bebus, not his future boss and non-professor trial judge, to interrogate these distinguished academics this afternoon. Uh, but Judge Bebus decided he wanted the early panel with Professor Tierney instead. <laughs> Just the latest iteration of that evergreen reminder that conservatives in particular should be careful when we wish for change. <laughs> this panel will spar over weighty topics such as standing, the major question doctrine, Chevron, and nationwide injunctions. Basically, all the big public law questions bubbling up through the courts these days. Reading up a bit for this panel reminded me, and perhaps you, Professor Lawson, of how some described preparing for a clerkship interview with Justice Scalia, which was an oral exam on all of law. <laughs> these subjects are not ones that I teach or write on every day. And yet, I am pretty sure that I am the only one up here who spent Thursday questioning a poor federal programs lawyer from DOJ and a deputy state attorney general on questions such as state standing, the major questions doctrine, Chevron, and nationwide injunctions. So if you see me taking furious notes, you'll know it's because I'm going back to school as well. And if you students ask a terrific question, maybe it'll make its way into the federal supplemental reporter later this month, who knows? 
So having begun a panel on judicial supremacy with that note on judicial humility, uh, I hesitate to offer much in the way of a thesis or headline in advance of the panel. Um, this is why good judges won't write the opinion's intro until they finish the analysis. But to offer just a bit of a roadmap for you all, I think it's fair to say you'll hear our panelists test many of our intuitions about separate and jealous power relationships between the federal courts and the political branches. Now, anyone who's attended more than one FedSoc event has heard us remind folks of Chief Justice Marshall's description of the emphatic prominence and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Professor Lawson will begin by distinguishing this authority to interpret and declare the law on the one hand and our duty to decide specific cases and controversies on the other. Or as Judge Kethledge and Professor Sunstein put it last night, how the law declaring power is at most perhaps incidental to our adjudicative power. Professor Harrison will then highlight some of the limits that many of us, perhaps especially us judges, take for granted sometimes as aspects of our judicial power exercised under Article III. But just because we think of precedent or preclusion or remedies as fundamental aspects of what courts do, does that necessarily mean that these flow from the Constitution itself? Perhaps these flow from subconstitutional law. If so, they would be potentially subject to revision by Congress, which would of course have serious implications for many of the current debates regarding the relative powers of the courts and the president. Professor Gerson will offer some specific examples of just that, uh, proposed legislative rules or limits that might bind the judiciary. And she'll discuss uh, the ways, some surprising, some not so much, that judges and the, even the executive have reacted to those efforts. This offers another way to test our intuitions or perhaps Madison's intuitions regarding how jealous of judicial authority Article I and II actors actually are and just how allergic we judges are to those efforts. Finally, batting cleanup at her request is Professor Tyler, uh, as teased, some of you may know, on a recent advisory opinions podcast. She'll address a couple of other uh, areas uh, that challenge our received separation of powers wisdom. Standing decisions in which the Supreme Court has limited Congress's authority to give us judges additional cases to decide, and major question decisions in which the Supreme Court has limited agencies' authority to address big or novel issues not clearly delegated by Congress. Even though I'm sure we all won't agree on all these questions, I'm confident we can uh, at least agree, despite uh, Citizens United, despite our political polarization, despite redistricting, that these are important topics that really do affect the role of the courts in our separation of powers. This is not just a dreamland panel. Uh, and they affect, perhaps much more importantly, our clients, uh, you, our students, and the people who come into our courtrooms. Uh, these questions will challenge the understanding of separation of powers many of us had when we first read, say, the Federalist Papers, or Alexander Bickel, or a matter of interpretation, and certainly what Ernie Young and I saw when we first watched Schoolhouse Rock in elementary school. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Professor Lawson. Thanks so much. Um, if we're gonna think about the role of the judicial power in the Constitution's scheme of separative powers, uh, might be a good idea to see what the Constitution says about this judicial power. Well, I'm not even gonna bother to open this to Article Three because it's not going to help. The Constitution doesn't say much. Um, it vests in judges defined by certain salary and tenure features, something called, quote, the judicial power of the United States. It does not tell us what that is. So we have the voice of Douglas Adams, the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Yes, but what exactly is it? Well, we don't know. That undefined power is then extended to certain cases and controversies. Uh, there's a mention uh, in the Constitution of matters of, quote, law and fact, not policy, mind you, but law and fact. Uh, and then other than a few constraints on certain kinds of uh, trials, that's, that's, that's basically it. So it's, it's a very, very sparse account of what one of the three functions of government is. Is that because it was so well understood what the judicial power was that there was no point? Well, that has already been handled on the prior panel uh, by uh, Judge Sugarman, 
who absolutely correctly pointed out, uh, no, it was a relatively novel idea for almost all of Anglo-American legal history. The judicial power wasn't a power at all, it was an aspect of executive power. Uh, if you're thinking about John Locke, uh, yeah, Locke identified three powers of government, a legislative, executive, federative, right? The foreign affairs power. No, no, judicial power is not part of that. Uh, it's not until 1701 that judges in England uh, uh, have uh, any kind of tenure uh, 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 at all, and that's only <laughs> during good behavior during the life of the monarch who appointed them. It's not until 1760, a quarter century before the Constitution, that there's anything remotely uh, resembling tenure during good behavior for English judges. So it's not like there's this long tradition of the judicial power being this distinctive aspect of a, of a governmental scheme. Nonetheless, by the time we get to 1788, we have people in the United States, like James Madison, talking about judicial power as just self-evidently one of the, quote, three great provinces of government power. Nothing more needs to be said. And then my favorite uh, from uh, John Adams talking about separated powers. Uh, now we're talking legislative, executive, judicial, a very non-Lockean trio. But that particular account, is, quote, have an unalterable foundation in nature. Uh, so we've gone from nowhere at all to unalterable foundation in nature in a remarkably short period of time. And then when Congress starts legislating uh, for the courts in 1789 and in the ensuing year, it's, it's talking about things like writs agreeable to the principles and usages of law, the ordinary rules of processes, the forms of proof and evidence, quote, as of actions at common law, or in the case of admiralty, according to the course of the civil law. So yeah, everybody kind of knew what this stuff was. And, and to a, at one level, they did. Um, judicial power was, was, was the sort of stuff that courts just did as a matter of course. But if we have to have a one-line definition, best one I found, uh, comes from James Wilson, and interestingly, it's almost identical to what Justice Campbell said earlier today. Wilson said the judicial authority consists in applying, according to the principles of right and justice, the Constitution and laws to facts and transactions in cases in which the manner or principles of this application are disputed by the parties interested in them. Fine. What do we do with that? Uh, well, it, it turns out, again, this entire conference has been designed to set things up for me uh, because Judge Kethledge, Friday night, nailed this perfectly, even using the language I wanted to use, the language of principles and incidents. It made my heart sing when I heard that last night. Of the Wilsonian formulation, where you've got applying the Constitution and laws as part one to cases disputed by the parties as part two, uh, which of those is the principal feature and which of those is the incident, is the principal aspect of judicial power, resolving disputes, and it just so happens that one perfectly good way to resolve disputes is to figure out the applicable law and facts and then apply it. Or is the principal feature the determination of law and fact, and it just so happens that the resolution of cases is the vehicle for it, as opposed, say, to a judge waking up some morning thinking, huh, I got a really cool idea about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Isn't that great? No, you've <laughs> got to have a vehicle for it. And, and, and it turns out this is, this is an important distinction. And uh, last night, uh, Judge Kethledge cited Chief Justice John Marshall for that first account where the case deciding power is principal and the law declaration function is incidental or secondary. Uh, but if we were uh, at Yale uh, instead of here, uh, they would be invoking an even higher authority than Chief Justice John Marshall. Uh, that is Yale Professor Owen Fiss. Uh, and uh, 40 years ago, four decades ago, uh, Professor Fiss uh, had a very different account of uh, what, what is principal and what is incident. A couple of passages from him, just from the late 70s, mid-1980s. 
The function of the judge is not to resolve disputes, but to give the proper meaning to our public values, right? Not dispute resolution, it's law declaration, or actually I should say Yale law declaration. Secondly, the judge's job, quote, is not to maximize the ends of private parties, nor simply to secure the peace, but to explicate and give force to the values embodied in authoritative texts, such as the Constitution and statutes, to interpret those values and wait for it, to bring reality into accord with them. Okay, now, um, I actually think that Professor Fiss's account is an empirically accurate description of the views, not only of a substantial per percentage of the American professoriate, uh, but probably a non-trivial percentage of judges as well. He wasn't just making this stuff up. So in the three minutes I have left, see if I can solve this. Okay, uh, Marshall beats Fiss. Um, and the reason why Marshall beats Fiss is not just because Marshall beats Fiss, um, but, but because there's, there's something fundamentally wrong about one thing Professor Fiss said. Judges don't exist merely to resolve disputes. There's nothing mere about resolving disputes. The whole reason why you have courts, the whole reason why the judicial function, never mind the power, the function exists in the first place, is precisely so that duels remain musicals or episodes of Firefly and not routine, ordinary means of settling matters. That's why they exist in the first place, right? And once you see the dispute resolution function of courts as their raison d'etre, as the principal thing, as and everything else, including law declaration, fact ascertainment, and yes, if necessary, policy judgment, all of those are simply incidents, aspects of things you need to do in order to carry out your principal function. All right, what does any of that have to do with any of the topics for today's Panel. Well, let me just throw one possible, well, there are two possible implications out there. Uh, the first is what is sometimes badly called uh, nationwide or universal injunctions. I don't like the formulation. Um, the more apt description is injunctions that enjoin defendants with respect to actions regarding non-parties to the case. Party A sues. Uh, and the judge says, okay, you're enjoined with respect to party A, and oh, by the way, with everybody else too. Um, under a dispute resolution model, of what it is the courts do, no, that's simply not part of the judicial power. The judicial power is to resolve the dispute. And the reasons why it is that the judge resolves that dispute, they're interesting, they're useful. It's helpful for judges to issue press releases along with their judgments. But what they're doing is issuing a judgment, and the judgment extends only as far as the parties to the case, because that's all the court is deciding. Now, it may very well be that in a particular case, the judge is quite convinced that the reason why this party should win is going to be the same reason that the next party should win, and the next party, and the party after that. And that's fine, but that just means that the next case before that judge will be a really easy one. But you have to have the next case. And it may be that the next case will come to a different judge who will have a different view, or even to the same judge, but maybe this time the parties present different arguments and considerations and you reach a different answer. In any case, the judicial power is not the power to decide what other government actors can and can't do. It's just not what it is. It's the power to resolve disputes, right? Everything else is an incident. Second point, and I can get this one out in 10 seconds, it also means that Ben Ponce's favorite Cass Sunstein book one case at a time, might have a point. That Sunstein fellow, smart guy. <laughs> All right, thank you, Professor Harrison. Thank you, Judge. I see the theme this weekend is it's all about the Benjamins. <laughs> Our topic is why separate powers. It's 2024. In 1987, the first time I was on a panel at a Federalist Student Symposium at the University of Chicago. The topic for the panel was the role of the legislative and executive branches in interpreting the Constitution. So this is the update. 
and you can decide whether I've learned anything in the last 37 years. My thesis is following Gary, that the Constitution provides for a limited form of judicial supremacy based on and consisting of the court's authority to decide cases or controversies. Second point is the practical effect of what the courts do, what we might think of as the infrastructure of judicial supremacy depends in large measure on the subconstitutional law, not the constitutional separation of powers itself. My third point, which I won't be elaborating, but it goes to the whole theme of this conference, is that this is an example of a broader principle, which is separation of powers is really thin. Whenever we tend to think about separation of powers, we tend to think about other issues that we then feed into separation of powers. Like when Judge Kethledge last night was talking about it takes three branches to coerce. What does it mean to coerce? Coercion is defined by the content of people's rights, not by the separation of powers. Right, in 2024, as Gary just said, one of the topics in which judicial supremacy, the relationship between the executive and the judiciary is very much in play has to, come, has to do with so-called universal remedies uh, nationwide injunctions, I, universal remedies I think is a better term certainly than nationwide injunctions. That happens when a single district judge gives an order to a government agency concerning what the government agency is to do with respect to everyone and not just with respect to the person who brought the lawsuit. I'm gonna use that kind of case as a test bed, as a source of examples of what I'm going to say about what separation of powers is for, and then how so much of what we think of as the judicial role is determined by these subconstitutional the sources of law. First, back to separation of powers, the big, the big topic, why separate powers? One reason to separate powers the way the United States system does is to have an institution devoted to the rule of law. Other institutions, the lawmaking institution, uh, the institution that builds roads and conducts wars and does other actual things, might not be concerned with the rule of law as much as maybe specialists in the rule of law. So having specialists in the rule of law, giving them some kind of finality, some kind of supremacy, is a way of ensuring the rule of law. Now, of course, well, everybody's human, nobody can really be trusted, including Article Three judges, sorry, judge. And there is therefore the next question, well, if there's gonna be a rule of law institution, what is going to keep those people in their lane of doing law and not just running the country? What is to keep the judiciary from becoming a third house of the legislature staffed with graduates of the Harvard Law School? Lest that seem rude to our hosts, let me say the only thing worse would be a third house of the legislature, the staff with former inmates of an institution at 127 Wall Street in New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> What is, what is going to do that? The first, the first way the Constitution does that is simply dividing the concepts, saying there's a difference between executive power and judicial power and legislative power, then assigning one of those conceptual powers to an institution, then trying to ensure that the people in that institution will not be too politically beholden to the political actors in the other two institutions. Okay, that creates judicial independence, but what's going to keep the courts in their lane? A lot of the work, at least as we've come to understand the system over the last couple hundred years, of keeping the courts in their lane is done by what Gary was just describing. The principle that they don't generally expound the law and maybe, this would never happen in America, slip in some of their own views about what the law ought to be. Rather, they decide particular concrete disputes. That's an imperfect way of keeping them in their lane of doing law and not just running the country, but it's built into the, it's built into the Constitution. Well, how does, how does, how does that, that system work? Having the courts just decide concrete disputes. And again, my main point is a lot of what we think of as the principles that do that, that have the courts decide just concrete disputes, don't come from the Constitution itself. Think again about universal or nationwide relief where a single district court might be able to do something that in effect binds everybody throughout the country. Is it shocking that a court can do that? No, there's a court that does that. It's the Supreme Court of the United States. 
Why does the Supreme Court of the United States do that? Because of the rules of stare decisis and precedent. They, set, they set precedents on questions of federal law that are treated as binding by all the other courts in the United States. It is the legal rules about precedent that give the court that authority. My view, I, somewhat controversial, but I think if you, the more you think about it, the more sense it makes, and in part this is inspired uh, by Gary Lawson's work on thinking of questions about how to decide uncertainty in law. The doctrine of precedent is a way of resolving questions about uncertainty in law. It is like the rules of evidence for finding out what the law is. Well, who can make the rules of evidence for the federal courts through the horizontal effect of the necessary and proper clause? Congress can. My view is Congress can alter within the limits of a reasonable rule of stare decisis, the rules of stare decisis used by the federal courts, and therefore could say that the first district judge that reaches a question having to do with the legality of what a federal agency is doing would set a precedent that would bind all other courts. I think that would be fine. Let me hasten to say, since there's an ongoing dispute about whether Congress has done anything like that in the Administrative Procedure Act, my answer is they haven't. But my point here is they could. The second point, one of the things I learned in my 10 years as, at the Justice Department was no suit against the government is ripe until it's, mute, until it's moot. <laughs> another thing I learned, and I'm sure the judge has heard that, another thing I learned is there is no estoppel against the United States. That's part of the law of judgments. The law of judgments isn't in Article III. The law of judgments is so much not in Article III that there's a restatement about it. It's a body of law that's been adumbrated by the courts over the decades the way the law of stare decisis has. And of course, I'm going to say that Congress can change the law of judgments. Congress could, oh my God, heaven forbid, say that the United States is subject to non-mutual issue preclusion. So that the first time the United States loses a, a suit, all other parties can then take advantage of that. Again, I don't think Congress has done that, but I think they can. Another body of subconstitutional law that Congress largely controls that's extremely important in federal courts is the law of remedies. Now, building on the equity, the law of equity as it existed at the beginning of the Constitution, but building on it because it was then and is now subconstitutional law. So Congress could decide that in some cases involving federal agencies, like having to do with the adoption of a rule that the court concludes is wholly invalid, that the remedy the court would give would be to order the agency to rescind the rule, which would in effect have effects on non-parties. I think that would be, be constitutional. As I keep saying, I don't think Congress has done that. But the point I want to conclude with is making those judgments. What should stare decisis look like? What should the law of judgments look like? What should the law of federal remedies look like? Calls for policy trade-offs. Somebody deciding what are the costs, what are the benefits for the public? For which rules do the costs exceed the benefits? For which rules do the benefits exceed the costs? That's the kind of judgment that should be made by a legislature. That's another reason to separate powers, is have decisions like that made by elected officials. Well, that's the update, and maybe there will be more in 2061. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Professor Gerson. Thank you. Um, so many of you are going to be graduating at some point and then going to work in law firms. And some of you will work in the federal government. Some of you will be clerking. Um, some will end up in the executive branch or working in Congress. And the thing is, in, in, in all of those places, other than in the federal, federal judiciary, you will be protected by employment protections like you know laws that are either Title VII or laws that apply, like Title VII, in the executive branch and in Congress to give um, discrimination protections against employees. Well, um, over y the years, over the decades, um, Congress has strongly opposed employment statutes to be passed by Congress that would bind the judicial branch. So every time Congress has made a move to apply Title VII and other anti-discrimination employment law type protections to the judicial branch, the way that Congress has bound itself and its employees, um, and Congress has bound the executive branch. Well, the um, judicial conference has showed up each time to testify on the Hill um, to say, this is a bad idea. Don't do it. We're very disappointed. You're even considering it. 
Um, it's not necessary, it's not advisable, and the reasons that are classically given are um, because of, quote, judicial independence, and also, um, even though they, they haven't said directly that it, it be, that it would be a separation of powers violation, that, that that's certainly the flavor of the explanation for why this is not a good idea for Congress to do, and, and also because the judiciary is the branch that resolves disputes, um, and they know how to resolve disputes in the employment arena. When, when there's an allegation of discrimination, they do it all the time. Um, they know how to do that, and so that they can do that for their employees and, and create similar protections on their own without the involvement of any of the other branches. That has been the explanation, and in the words of um, then uh, Chief Judge Merrick Garland, when this came up while he was um, while he was chief judge, he, he said, you know, we think that we can police ourselves. So currently we do have this judicial exceptionalism um, and that statutory workplace discrimination protections apply to all other, you know, all other em employees of the federal government, but not to the tens of thousands of judicial branch employees. Most of them do not have jobs actually relating to the substance of judging. You know, we're talking about everyone in that, in those buildings like janitors and secretaries and um, you know, law clerks are a small slice of those employees. Um, so most federal employees have, judicial, um, have access to EEOC, complaint process, or the civil cause of action provided by Title VII. Um, judiciary employees do not. Um, so my, my former student, Olivia Warren, who graduated a few, a few years ago, testified before the House Judiciary Committee in 2020 that she was very severely sexually harassed while working as a clerk for Judge Stephen Reinhardt. Um, so as I said, each time Congress thinks to do something, um, judges have strongly said, pushed back and said, you know, the value of judicial independence and the ability to regulate ourselves on matters of discrimination and employment um, militates against this. And so I, I have to disclose as part of this that from 2021 to 2023, I was the lead attorney in a constitutional case against the federal judiciary as a whole, alleging that the judiciary um, has, has a process, internal process for um, taking in complaints of sexual harassment, sex discrimination, a lot of other kinds of discrimination, um, and that, that those policies and procedures were inadequate, so inadequate that they violate procedural due process and equal protection, um, and this, um, and that the, the the plaintiff in this case, she was an employee who alleged sexual harassment and sex discrimination by her employee, by her employer, by her supervisors. So the complaint had been dismissed at the district court level, in part because um, I think part of the. Judges, district court judges' reasoning involves some idea that, well, Congress hasn't pr provided Title VII type protections, and you're basically trying to replicate kind of Title VII protections by making a constitutional claim. Um, but then we won in the Fourth Circuit um, on the constitutional claims of due process and equal protection. And uh, you might be able to imagine, we're, we're litigating a case against the federal judiciary in the federal judiciary about constitutional law and how it applies to federal judiciary actions um, and officials. You know, one of the defendants, the named defendants, was a chief judge of a circuit. Um, and then it had to be litigated in that exact circuit where the conduct had been alleged. And so then different judges had to be appointed from other circuits to sit on a three-judge panel, even though it was technically in the Fourth Circuit. And then as a result of all of that, in, in the process, you can, you, can, you can only imagine, it was like we, we had to fight about who was gonna get to pick the three judges, should it be the, the judges from the, the circuit that was actually being sued in the case, um, should it be employees from the um, Fourth Circuit who should actually you know, be like administering the case and having discretion over all kinds of decisions about how the case would proceed, it was, it was really messy. Um, but in the, at the end of the day, the Fourth Circuit held for the first time that employees had these protections through the Constitution itself, even if not through Title VII. So I was also counsel um, for that former employee, Karen Strickland, when she testified in Congress after the House introduced a bill, the Judiciary Accountability Act. Um, and that bill would provide workplace discrimination protections. It, it would use the frameworks of Title VII and other employment laws 
and apply them to the federal judiciary, um, create an independent process for reporting, address complaints um, through an outside commission on judicial integrity whose members are not federal judicial employees, because part of the problem, of course, is that like the very people you are accusing, and that was true in the case that I litigated, that the person she was accusing was a decider in the case that she then reported internally to the judiciary. So that is, um, that's one of the things it tries to address, and of course it creates a, it would create a cause of action in court. Um, as expected, the Judicial Conference was very opposed to it and, and sent judges to the Hill to, to that hearing and saying that it would interfere with the judiciary's internal governance and impose intrusive requirements on the judiciary. Um, now, in the separate context of judicial ethics, um, Chief Justice has also said that Congress, uh, that the court has never addressed whether Congress may impose um, ethical requirements on the Supreme Court, and also um, in the context of financial reporting gift requirements, the limits of Congress's power to require recusals have never been tested. So these are all ways of saying there are some serious separation of powers concerns here if Congress goes um, in this direction. And last year when the Judiciary Committee invited the Chief Justice to testify at a hearing on Supreme Court uh, ethics reform, the Chief Justice declined in light of the separation of powers concerns and the importance of preserving judicial independence. So the, these are themes that keep coming up every time Congress wants to think about regulating um, the judicial branch um, in these ways. Um, so the question, of course, that arises is how the judicial power and judicial supremacy relate to the plausibility of the judicial branch rebuffing these impulses um, to regulate the judicial branch when it comes to misconduct and employment discrimination and the citation of judicial independence and separation of powers. Um, and I think it's kind of whether it's a, you know, no matter what, you know, the party of the president that appointed the judge, there is kind of this understanding that judicial independence is, is maybe may may threatened by, by such a move. Is it plausible that because of the unique role of the judiciary, Congress needs to refrain from legislating it in order to bind the judicial branch in these matters? When it comes to judicial supremacy, we're usually talking about the judiciary getting the final say on the meaning of a law that applies to others. But does the judicial power or judicial supremacy also entail the judiciary getting the final say, or only say really, on judicial branch affairs in things like employment discrimination or ethics? And is that say that these judicial branch affairs are entirely unregulable? by other branches, that only the judicial branch can regulate these matters internal to itself. I think you know, there is, of course, a natural inclination that, that may arise to resist and want to implement binding rules on Article III employees. And the executive branch has typically, uh, the executive branch itself also historically resisted Congress regulating it on these matters, but ultimately it, Congress did regulate it. The judiciary is continuing to do the same thing to this day. If Congress does go the route of passing statutes that bind the judicial branch for employment discrimination, it may also mean that the executive will be enforcing these rules against the judiciary. And the reasonable fear, of course, is that with this tool, the executive may seek to control and influence Article III. Um, so even though the public discourse right now in the er area of judicial ethics involves the judiciary, invo you know, like things like gifts and disclosures, the, the over, you know, the, the issue overhanging it is kind of this, eth this idea that ethical lapses insinuate outside influence on Supreme Court justice. But we would be moving to influence inside, like, you know, the executive branch influence on Article three through the phenomenon of regulating employment discrimination. And so basically, um, I think that, I, I should just put my own cards on the table, I do not believe that the judiciary is doing a good job of regulating itself when it comes to these um, employment discrimination matters. And the question is, do we think somehow that the judicial role uh, requires us to say, oh well, it's really not great, but that's what we have to have because of the separation of powers. And I look forward to your, th your reactions. Thank you, Professor Gerson. Professor Tyler, we've done an amazing job of staying on time so far. I have no so doubt far. that you will be able to continue the streak. So I, at first, I want to thank uh, everyone for having me. And I, it is such a privilege to be on this panel with such a distinguished set of colleagues uh, in the academy and on the bench. 
I do want to pause right at the outset and say I think it is quite significant to highlight the fact that you have two RBG clerks on this panel. That was supposed to get more laughs. <laughs> Nervous laughter? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. The other thing I want to highlight at the outset is that in a meeting I was not present at, they apparently decided on hard rules about the clock. So um, I'll do my best, but I don't want anything I've just said to count against my time. <laughs> my focus today will be anchored in the Supreme Court's recent decisions that on one account seek to force Congress to decide important questions within the scope of their Article I powers, or on a different, arguably complementary account, seek to protect Congress's prerogatives from infringement in particular by the executive, and possibly, though of course this is what I will try to tease out from the judiciary as well. So I want to talk about what I have in mind in terms of the principles in the cases, then I want to raise some questions, and finally I want to flag what I consider to be a puzzle raised by these developments. So first, what am I talking about? I can't help but start with Youngstown. I was teaching it this week to one of the students in the audience. As we all know, Truman seized the steel, mill, steel mills at the height of the Korean War, saying that you know, they were about to go on strike and this would be disastrous for the war effort and particularly for the manufacture of munitions. Of importance, of importance to some of the justices on the court, Congress had not declared war. Of importance to all of the justices in the majority, Congress had not more specifically authorized the seizure, and indeed on some accounts had indicated its opposition to the idea. Now the court, as we all know, rejected what Truman did. Justice Black's opinion said this is a job for the nation's lawmakers, not for its military authorities. Justice Jackson's opinion said, nothing in our Constitution is plainer than the declaration of war is entrusted only to Congress, which he says means it lays upon Congress primary responsibility for supplying the armed forces. Now, one could argue that some of the court's recent decisions in the major questions realm are involved or turn on similar considerations. In West Virginia versus EPA 2022, the Chief Justice for the court held that the EPA did not have the requisite authority to adopt its Clean Power Plan, which by capping greenhouse gas emissions aggressively would force power plants to transition to cleaner methods to generate electricity. In so doing, he wrote, in certain extraordinary cases, both separation of powers principles and practical understanding of legislative intent make us reluctant to read into ambiguous statutory text the delegation claimed to be lurking there. To convince us otherwise, something more than a merely plausible textual basis for the agency action is necessary. There must be clear congressional authorization. This is because, the court said, there are extraordinary cases that call for a different approach, cases in which the history and breadth of the authority that the agency is asserting and the economic and political significance of that assertion provide a reason to hesitate before concluding that Congress meant to confer such authority. Now, Justice Gorsuch, as you all know, has written a lot about this, and in his dissent in Gundy versus United States, joined by the Chief and Justice Thomas, he described the idea this way. We apply the major questions doctrine in the service of the constitutional rule that Congress may not divest itself of its legislative power by transferring that power to an executive agency. Another example that may arise this term is, uh, we'll wait and see what the court does with respect to the Chevron doctrine in the Loper Bright and Relentless cases. On one account in these cases, the court is, as I said, prodding, uh, prodding Congress to stop passing the buck. On another account, what the court is doing is protecting Congress's powers from slipping away. Of course, in all of this, we have to be reminded, this is why I started with Youngstown, of Justice Jackson's line, we may say the power to legislate for emergencies belongs in the hands of Congress, but only Congress itself can prevent power from slipping through its fingers. I come now first to my question. How far will this attention to major questions go? How, how far will this particular attention to seeing that Congress does what Congress is supposed to be doing go? What is a major question? What is a minor question? Will all major questions require Congress uh, to be as exceptionally clear that it is deciding the issue and, how it, and, a, and, and about how it is deciding this issue? 
Might we see analogous considerations reinvigorate a non-delegation doctrine? Justice Gorsuch in particular tends to link the two. And turning back to the context within which I started, war and emergency powers, such an attention could have considerable force and bite. Think about the War Powers Act, which among other things lets the president commit troops for a period of time before Congress uh, is forced, at, at least in theory, to address the question. Of course, the Constitution assigns Congress the power to declare war, establishing a framework that the founding generation believed was the right one, even if clunky, because it was clunky. The whole idea was we don't want to go to war lightly after what we've just come through. Now, if more recent doctrine is concerned about the executive trampling on the uh, legislative power and making major decisions for it, how does the War Powers Act stand up? Or take the 100 plus provisions that give the president emergency powers on a declaration of a national emergency. Among other things, to the horror of my teenagers, I flag that on one reading of those powers, uh, the president can shut down the internet. There goes Snapchat and TikTok and all of that stuff. Okay. So uh, before you get too scared, I, I will say that there is an, a, a National Emergencies Act you may know about, and Congress, through that framework, can override such a decision. But in the 40 years we've lived under that regime, Congress has not met a single time to decide or debate whether to end a declared national emergency. So how well does that work? Will we get renewed attention to such issues in light of the court's recent attention to preserving Congress's role in the separation of power scheme. This then brings me finally to my puzzle. I hope I'm keeping up on a good pace, Judge. Uh, I am intrigued with what follows if we put the court's major questions doctrine cases in conversation with two other areas of the court's jurisprudence, particularly its jurisprudence on public and private rights and its more recent standing jurisprudence. So let's start with the former. When can Congress assign enforcement of claims or rights to non-Article III tribunals? Here, the court's case law, putting it charitably, is quite messy. But the inquiry, rightly or wrongly, is often turned on how we define public and private rights. Again, that is super messy. But one line of cases supports the idea that if Congress creates the right, it gets to decide how it's enforced. Take Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez from 1978. In that case, the court upheld a scheme uh, by which newly created rights in the ICRA, the Indian Civil Rights Act, could only be advanced and, and enforced in tribal courts. Consider the much maligned case of CFTC versus Shore. There was a lot going on in that case, two claims. One, a claim created by the Commodities Exchange Act, and one, a common law claim. All nine justices agreed the claim created by the Commodities Exchange Act could be litigated before the commission, did not have to be litigated before an Article III court. This understanding seems to inform the Chief Justice's decision in Stern versus Marshall, in which he draws a distinction between claims created by Congress and within its regulatory authority and claims outside that authority, which in the case of Stern versus Marshall involved the particular claim at issue, which he said could not proceed before a bankruptcy judge. Here, I would argue the Chief Justice was channeling Justice Brennan, who wrote in Northern Pipeline, that when Congress creates a statutory right, it has the discretion in defining that right to create presumptions, assign burdens of proof, or prescribe remedies. And it may also provide that persons seeking to vindicate that right must do so before particularized tribunals created to perform the specialized adjudicative tasks related to that right. Such provisions do, in a sense, affect the exercise of judicial power, but they are incidental to Congress's power to define uh, that right that it has created. Now, I realize here I've just, created, I've just committed a huge faux pas in quoting Justice Brennan at this convention. You'll have to forgive me. I thought I was still in Berkeley. I forgot. <laughs> uh, but the point here is that the source of the right is hugely significant, or at least it was to the Chief Justice's analysis. And this, combined with the major questions doctrine, leads to my puzzle. If Congress gets, if that, if that line of cases is, is right and, and the chief's view and stern controls, or at least his view as I read it to be, controls, and if Congress gets broad latitude to define how a right it creates is, is enforced and can even send enforcement of that right 
to an agency or a non-Article III tribunal of some kind, and the court is increasingly encouraging, shall we say, Congress to take the primary role in legislating down to the gritty details, see the major questions doctrine cases, what explains the court's current standing jurisprudence? And I'm thinking in particular of the cases of Spokio and TransUnion. Why is the court saying it's not enough for Congress to create a right, declare an infringement of that right equals a legal injury, and provide an enforcement scheme pursuant to which the rights holder gets to go to an Article III court? Focus on TransUnion. For the majority in that case, Justice Kavanaugh said that only some of the plaintiffs in the class action could come into federal court to advance the claims Congress had given them under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Specifically, the majority, building on Spokio, held that uh, to be deemed a concrete injury sufficient to come into an Article III court, the plaintiffs must identify a close historical or common law analog for their asserted injury. So for those whose erroneous credit reports were circulated to third parties, they get to come into court because they can analogize their claims to a common law claim. But for those whose credit reports said that they were on a terrorist watch list, but those reports weren't circulated, even though Congress had declared that to be a legal injury and provided for a right of action to seek damages in federal court, they did not get to proceed under the majority opinion. So even though Congress's views, we are told, should be afforded due respect in framing those rights and injuries and standing, Congress, the court said, may not simply enact an injury into existence. Now, Justice Thomas concurred in part and dissented, for my purposes, in relevant part, saying this is all wrong. In particular, he says, with a, with a significant caveat, which we can get into later if people are interested, that legal injury, that is to say Congress saying you are injured, is enough. For Thomas, the inquiry was simple. As he wrote, courts for centuries held that an injury in law to a, a right that is not related to duties owed collectively to the community is enough to create a case or controversy. And he gives examples historically. Now here, Justice Thomas's, and I promise I'm wrapping up, Judge, Justice Thomas's approach is consistent with the approach to standing long advocated by Judge Fletcher, and more recently being promoted, at least in, in a related way, by Judge Newsom on the 11th Circuit. Judge Fletcher in The Structure of Standing, a, a famous article published in the Yale Law Journal in 1988, wrote that if a duty is statutory, Congress should have essentially unlimited power to define the class of persons entitled to enforce that duty. For congressional power to create the duty should include the power to define those who have standing to enforce it. More recently, Judge Newsom said, an Article III case exists whenever the plaintiff has a cause of action. It's really quite simple in his view. Now this has long struck me as the right approach to standing, but that's not the point. My point is this, regardless of whether you agree with me, it is hard to understand why this approach doesn't control in the standing jurisprudence in light of the major questions doctrine cases and the court's recent, uh, or uh, not so recent, but long-standing uh, approach to public and private rights and non-Article III tribunals. Let me put it this way to conclude. If the court purports to be protecting Congress's prerogatives and or wanting to force Congress to do its job, there is a forceful argument to be made that the court should respect Congress's decisions when it does just that. Thank you. Thank you, and well done. Uh, I told you we were going to cover a lot of law in a relatively short period of time. Um, let's see how some of these um, streams flow together, perhaps. Um, here's a hypo for the panel. Um, let's imagine that the uh, Gerson Harrison presidential ticket, we won't say the Harrison-Tyler ticket, we won't tempt fate in that way. Um, the Gerson-Harrison ticket wins the presidency and sweeps a maximalist power-wielding Congress into office. Should we judges expect a code of decision-making rules, deference doctrines, race to courthouse presidential rules, subpoenas for court records? Um, this may sound extreme, but then again, a lot of the post-Nixon era legislation regulating the presidency seemed extremely extreme to the likes of Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. Um, put another way, we hear a lot, we've heard a lot today about the consequences of a 
quote unquote, do nothing Congress uh, and its effect on the separation of powers, specifically as between agencies and courts. But I wonder if the separation of powers would really be healthier if some of these latent line drawing questions that we've all been teasing out for years, really, in law review articles and panels like this, were actually litigated in courts in Congress because Congress um, you know, enacted laws that were, would be seen by some as intruding on the prerogative of judges. Um, in other words, could legislative efforts uh, to pursue, um, uh, to push back on judicial supremacy actually make things worse, not better, for the critics of courts? Well, um, so I, uh, in the, in the, um, I think that in the main, the limited form of judicial supremacy that John was talking about, it, it, it really, and, and then also the idea of the specialists in the rule of law that also came up, that spe the, 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 the courts are specialists in the rule of law and that that entails certain um, arrangements. Um, and in the, in the realm of employment discrimination and things like, you know, things that regulate um, judges' conduct, it's not just about staying in their lane in terms of the different branches and staying in the judicial role, but what do we do about, um, what do we do about acts of misconduct that, um, that judges are very familiar with as dispute resolvers and people who, who do things like find facts and decide on how law applies? And what do we do about the fact that judges also need regulations in order to um, keep a check on those things? So in terms of Congress, you know, you're, you're asking, could it make things worse? Because after all, it's the judges who, some of whom That's will right. feel targeted by the legislation, who would then resolve the cases, who have um, separation of powers principles, notions of Article Three independence more robust than Professor Lawson's mm -hmm. as the nearest tool at hand. And they would be the ones uh, presumably resolving that inevitable constitutional challenge. Yeah, so I, I don't like to assume that judges are gonna feel vindictive or, or um, um, automatically that they're gonna be resistant once Congress has said, these are rules that apply to you too. And you know, in my own concern, the, a lot of my academic career has been devoted to the concept of procedural due process and a fundamental fairness in inside institutions that are not the judiciary, just institutions like schools and universities and um, employers. And often it is about the processes that are, are being employed inside um, that before they get to courts or maybe they never get to courts, but every day these kinds of investigations and adjudications are going on inside institutions. And then when things go wrong, sometimes they go to courts and then judges uh, have no trouble saying, well, that procedure that you used inside your institution, whether it's a state university or a private university or, or an employer, did not satisfy the legal requirements that either Congress said that you're bound to or the Constitution requires under the due process clause. Like that's something that happens every day. And yet, um, when it comes to judicial processes or, or processes within the judicial branch um, to, to adjudicate these kinds of things, um, there really is no mechanism for review. And so I, I, I do think that the, some of the concern, and, and I share this concern, that you don't want to open up um, a whole bunch of judicial decision making and the process of judicial decision making to things like discovery and things like you know inquiries about how judges interacted with their law clerks that might you know um, implicate certain substance of cases, but that just seems like it's um, it's it's the kind of thing that legislative acts would be able to carve around because when you're talking about fair processes like did you get a hearing. Did you get a hearing that was before an adjudicator that was not actually the person that you were accusing of misconduct? We're talking about really, really basic concepts that currently do not actually bind the judiciary. And so if the judiciary internally wants to say, like the, the, the person you're accusing of misconduct is the person who's gonna be deciding your complaint. Right now, um, the only way that that can be resolved is through um, a constitutional lawsuit. And I, I do think that um, some of the 
concerns about intrusion on the, uh, the federal judiciary's processes or the substance of their work is extremely overblown. And it's understandable that judges would not want this regulate. It's better, everyone wants to regulate themselves. Imp private employers want to <laughs> regulate themselves. Everyone does. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I, it's just, it's, this is not really a tenable situation. And I don't think that judge, I don't want to assume that judges react to it by being like, well, fine, we're then just going to try to circumvent what Congress did. Professor Harrison, would the, would the response be different with respect to legislation, say, about fund, de decisional aspects of the judicial role? Two things. I think first, first, let me elaborate on sort of a, pre a, prem a premise of all this because I, I got th I got this out. The so there is a source of congressional power for this, and it's important to know what it is and how and how it works. And it's going to feed into my to my answer there, which is the back part of the necessary and proper power. Congress has, and we have Gary here, a leading scholar of the necessary and proper power. To make all, has power to make all laws which will be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, that's the first part, that's the part you hear about in McCulloch, and all other powers vested in the, by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof, including the judges, including the executive department, including the judicial department, meaning the point of, and that's what I call the horizontal necessary and proper power. The point, the point of doing that is to provide the legal structure through which the other powers will work better. And I think that one way to make any bureaucracy work better, whether it be the huge bureaucracy of the federal executive or the much smaller bureaucracy of the federal courts, is, is, to, is to subject it to the rule of law, rules created by somebody else and not just by the decision makers. I think that, con that contributes, especially to the rule of law institution, the, fe the, federal, the federal judiciary, contributes both to its better functioning and to greater public confidence in it. I, th I think one thing we know about uh, the, the, spe the specific question as to you know, deliberations and so forth, one thing, one thing we know from congressional regulation of the executive branch in these areas using that power is that it is possible for Congress, sometimes with the executive branch pushing on this, it is possible for Congress to come up with rules that provide both a reasonable level of public access to information and protection for the genuinely important deliberative discussions or for something I generally, I think, much more relevant to the executive than the judiciary, national security information. There are ways to protect that, and I and I would say this this isn't this isn't on the platform in the presidential campaign, <laughs> um, but if I were I were drafting the if I were drafting the platform, it would say it would say something about Congress demonstrating its even handedness by applying to the judiciary the rules that it has already created for the executive branch, and that and that have been dis designed to create a reasonable balance between public access to information about what the people's employees are doing and the genuine need for confidentiality in the formulation of government decisions. I think, I think, I think it can be done and it would make the, make the, make the government better. Amanda, Amanda? I think the through line here is this idea that we're trying to get down to the essence of what each branch's role is and my comments are about the Congress's job is to legislate. When we think about the courts, the through line through all of our comments, I think, is their job is to decide cases. And I don't understand what my wonderful neighbor to be proposing to infringe at all on that. And that, I think, is exceptionally important, particularly when you put that point in conversation with a lot of the case law of which there is a lot on the question, when does Congress infringe on the power to decide cases? And so if you look at a case like Bank Markazi or Patch Act, some of the cases that debate the reconstruction case of Klein, they all turn on this question, Seattle Robertson and Seattle Audubon, other cases like this all dive into this question, at what point does Congress, in playing with statutory law and amending statutory law within its Article I powers and applying those changes to pending cases, sometimes at a very small, specific uh, 
uh, in a very specific way, i.e. to cases pending in court that are named out in the legislation by their docket number, the court has upheld such laws saying that Congress is changing the underlying law. It's not actually telling us how to decide the case. And if that's okay, then surely regulating judges as in interacting with their employees is okay because it, it's nowhere near the line that crosses into telling them how to decide cases. May I? I, 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 want, to, I want to recruit what Professor Tyler just said for the fundamental point that separation of powers is a lot thinner than you think. An enormous amount of the work, for example, in a case like Klein, in cases like Stern against Marshall, CFTC against Shore, is done by the question, what is the extent of Congress's power to control private rights, to decide what the substance of the law is going to be? Seattle Audubon, is Congress trying to decide a case, or is Congress changing the, was it the Forest Service? Yeah. Or is Congress changing Spotted the rules elves. that the Forest Service operates? Youngstown Sheet and Two. The limit, the, the line between the legislative power and the executive power in Youngstown is drawn by the fact that the legislative power can change private rights and the executive power on its own can't. The substance of the, law, the lines routinely comes from the content of the law, from the content of people's rights. Well, I'm just going to throw one thing in there. Um, I. <laughs> One thing on which John and I have disagreed for a long time, actually it's two things, but they're closely related. I actually think separation of powers is thicker than, than John does, and maybe thicker than he thinks I think it is. And as a consequence of that, I think Congress's power under the Necessary and Proper Clause is smaller than John thinks it is, because those laws for other departments have to be both necessary and proper, and for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Now, a lot of my writing has been on the necessary and proper part, but the, the for carrying into execution part is, is as or more important. They can pass laws to help other governmental actors along in their tasks. Doesn't mean they can have power to pass laws to screw them over. Uh, those are not necessarily laws for carrying into execution those other powers. And I think a lot of that, as well as the necessary and proper aspect, is constrained by, by what, what I think is, is a lot of content packed into those undefined words, legislative, executive, and judicial. My point in my talk was, yeah, th th this is all kind of a new thing. Uh, there's not a lot of history behind it, but you have to take the Constitution as it is. And by the time you get to 1788, you have a document that obviously orients its entire structure around this division of legislative, executive, judicial, which you got people like John Adams saying it was in the nature, unalterable nature of things. And that, that may have been a preposterous pretension, but the, the Constitution as a document obviously believes that because it structured the entire thing around it. So if you aren't trying, however hard it may be, to give real content to those terms, I just don't think you're interpreting the document as it is. So the reason why 37 years later we're still talking about the same things that John was talking about back then is because it's really hard to figure out what legislative, executive, and judicial powers mean when the document hasn't bothered to define them. Doesn't mean that isn't the task and it doesn't mean that it can't be done. So, uh, I have no doubt that you all are correct about the natural logical impl implications of these uh, precedents regarding regulating decisions. I'm just gonna say, uh, anecdotally, I have colleagues who think so much of the separated powers that they think the six months report is unconstitutional, which is just a list of cases that are pending. I asked them if they think our paychecks are unconstitutional. <laughs> um, I, 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 I do wonder, I think about something in this from this morning, though, um, echoes of the federalism, of some federalism debates, like uh, points we heard on the first panel. Um, I mean, there's a whole body of, of an, it's perhaps analogous case law about um, rights of action with respect to states and state actors in which um, uh, I believe the courts didn't just say, well, you know, there's nothing uh, you know, there's no state, um, there's no you know, article with respect to the states. We're going to look at the 14th Amendment very carefully. We're going to tease out a complicated test. No doubt 
Some of that is objectionable to some people up here. Um, um, but it is a lot of law that's out there, driven in part by structural concerns about, well, what is the limiting principle if Congress is allowed to create, say, damages actions against state actors? Um, and those are states that have actual political powers to uh, influence very directly the election of the president and the election of con selection of Congress. Um, are there limits for courts who can't fight back and, uh, or shouldn't fight back in the political process? In other words, is there a flip side in terms of, um, you know, a, a perhaps an aspect of the, um, you know, the, the decisional aspect of deciding cases and controversies that would mark an outer limit that could affect these debates on judicial supremacy, maybe aiding um, the argument that it is not as vast as we think. Is that to me? I mean, I, <laughs> I think the federal rules of evidence are unconstitutional. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably the wrong one to be answering this one. <laughs> and I'm not sure your colleagues are wrong about the reporting requirements. <laughs> I, uh, let, me, let, me say, let me say about that, that frequently it's the case that, especially when you're dealing with the bureaucracy, that rules about how the bureaucracy is going to run will, to some extent, impose burdens. They will also have benefits. Here's, here's, here's an example, and if Gary doesn't like the federal rules of evidence, he's really not going to like this. <laughs> Suppose... Congress decides to enact a statute saying presidential pardons must be reduced to writing. That imposes burdens on the pardon power. The pardon power comes straight out of the Constitution, but Congress has the horizontal necessary and proper power. Having pardons in writing does, in fact, because it creates a record that makes it easier to determine whether there's been a, been a pardon, does make the pardon power more efficacious. But there's a burden that comes along with that. Which is, the, which is the burden of having to, create, having to create the writing. Well, there's a plus and there's a minus. It seems, it seems to me, as I said, that that's what legislatures do, is that, and including situations where they, where they are both advancing and burdening the functions of another independent, as we say, branch of government, they are, tra they are trading off those costs and benefits. Should we go to audience questions? Raise your hand. Ben, I think we'll bring uh, microphone to you. Uh, hi, thank you all for being here. So I wanted to ask a quick question because it's not something that I hear brought up very often in the context of judicial supremacy. But how should the exceptions clause and jurisdiction stripping play into our understanding of judicial supremacy? Oh, an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Significantly, and would anyone like to elaborate? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm on record on that one, so um, it's it's not any great news. Um, I, I I think the exceptions clause means nothing like what most people think it means. Um, it, it's a way in which Congress can move around cases between the Supreme Court's original and appellate jurisdiction. In other words, the actual holding of Marbury versus Madison was, was actually wrong. Uh, the, the, the Constitution's allocation of original jurisdiction is not fixed in time. The whole point of the exceptions clause is to allow Congress to take some things that might have been original jurisdiction and make them appellate jurisdiction and, 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 and vice versa. It's not a way of taking cases that the Constitution already allocates to the federal judiciary and saying, oh, no, you can't hear them. Uh, I, I don't think Congress has that power at all. But, but you have to have the, the context here. Back in 1984, when, when then Judge Scalia interviewed me, he wasn't asking me about law at all. Um, it's because Judge Bork, who I'd been a student of in law school, told him not to hire me because I was bat guano crazy. <laughs> This is true. And so what he was trying to figure out is just how much guano uh, there, there was. Uh, and he may have gotten that one wrong. So you know, anything I say, you want to take in the context of Judge Bork thought he was out of his mind, uh, even to interview me, uh, much less to hire me. Other questions? Uh, can, uh, 
I'm, I'm going to take a substantially more conventional view on the, the, the exceptions clause than, than, Gary, than Gary does. We're here, at, we're here at Harvard, so I'm asking myself, what would Henry Hart say? And hen, although I don't 100% agree, the great Fed court scholar who was here at Harvard more or less created the field back in the 1950s. But the, a fundamental point that Hart made in his great dialogue about the power of Congress to restrict the jurisdiction of the federal courts is, is that, I'm going to put it this way, the exceptions power question is not a question about judicial supremacy. It's a question about the respective role of the federal courts and especially the Supreme Court of the United States and the state courts. The point with which Hart concludes, having decided that yes, Congress has substantial but not complete authority under the exceptions clause, is that in many ways, the, as, the, as the framers saw the Constitution, the primary guarantors of private rights, including private rights as they're protected by the federal Constitution, are the state courts. And when, co when Congress uses its exceptions power to the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of the United States, it is leaving cases in state courts, leaving cases in courts that are courts and that have an Article VI obligation uh, to treat federal law and the federal constitution as supreme. And another feature of the design is that Congress has an incentive not to go overboard with limiting the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of the United States, because the Supreme Court of the United States is the Supreme Court of the United States. It is a national level institution and spent its first 50 years reminding everybody that it was a national level institution, often telling the, federal, the state courts that they were under enforcing the federal, federal law. So judicial supremacy and even a pretty broad view of the exceptions power, such as I think I would take broader than Hart would have taken, get along just fine. In the back. Um, yes, thank you. I wonder how much this idea by Professor Harrison that Congress has the power to, using subconstitutional law to limit the power of courts, doesn't really hold true in the 14th Amendment context because of Flores and some of the preceding cases that seemingly circumscribes the power, um, the Section 5 of the 14th Amendment power of Congress. I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that what the court has done, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question perfectly, I'm afraid. But I don't, I don't, I don't think that the, that the views that the court has taken of the, sec, of the, section, of the section five power have, 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 mu have much of an effect on, its, on Congress's horizontal necessary and proper power. And that's, and that's, the, that's the primary source of its authority to, rig, to, to deal with the kinds of sub-constitutional law about the operation of the federal courts that I was talking about. Other hands? Right here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is that while there, there is a series of cases that says Congress has the power to delegate to non-Article III tribunals, should the Article III judiciary have the final say, like with judicial review, to tell what the law is? I think that's an open question at the Supreme Court uh, in the 2018 case of oil states and also at this roofing. So I wonder, like, what's your take on whether judicial review is always required for non-Article non III adjudication? Thank you. I suppose I should take that one. Um, you know, it's interesting when you teach these materials, you st I start with Kroll, and, and it says it's a, uh, a private rights case, but I think that's the wrong way to read it from a modern lens. I think it's a public rights case case in which uh, you're dealing with a dispute between two individuals that uh, is governed by a cause of action that's created under the Article I regulatory powers. I think the way the court frames the Article III uh, essentials, I think it calls them the essential attributes in that case, uh, 
is, is a, a good way to think about these problems, even though the terminology it uses we've updated considerably and we, we've, we've evolved in our thinking about these issues. But the idea is basically that we need to make sure as a first order matter and an Article III court is the right forum to do this, that Congress is acting within its Article I powers. And if it's not, then it can't, for example, regulate state law and a state common law claim Part of putting that claim in a non-Article III tribunal is effectively adjudicating, regulating, not adjudicating, regulating that claim, regulating in part the content of that claim and how it's enforced. And that's problematic. That's Stern versus Marshall. And, and the idea is that you need an Article III court, in that case, you know, the Supreme Court, saying, no, this Congress is acting beyond its powers. And again, that's why I think that's an, a, a really important complementary idea to thinking about standing if Congress is operating within the proper sphere of its authority and it creates this cause of action and it defines it as a, a, as a legal injury and provides for damages. I don't understand how this infringes on any other branch of government to say that they can go into Article III, uh, that is to say someone who can claim the protection of that scheme and, and, and enforce it. But that involves the court at, as in its essential role, making sure that Congress is not acting beyond its authority and, and making sure, for example, the more discreet question in Kroll is whether, for example, the claim in question actually was assigned to the agency, whether there are relevant facts that go to the jurisdiction of the agency. We need to make sure that the agency is acting within its delegated sphere of, of authority. And that, too, is an essential question for an Article III court. To answer. Yeah, and I, I will just add, speaking not for the cases, but for Lawson's guanoized uh, view of the Constitution, the, the answer is it depends on what the tribunal is deciding. Uh, recognize that a non-Article III tribunal is, for constitutional purposes, an executive agency, because obviously it's not Congress, and obviously it's not an Article III court, because we've just said it isn't, so the only thing left is an executive agency. And if that's true, what it won't be able to do on its own is deprive somebody of life, liberty, or property. Might very well be able to adjudicate benefits claims on its own without Article III review. That would be entirely up to Congress. But if it's depriving people of life, liberty, or property, I don't think you can do that uh, without, uh, without an Article III tribunal. I think we have one question I was told to my far left. Hi, thank you so much for coming. My name is Nate, and thanks for uh, looking over here to the far left. Um, I, I'm comfortable. My question, so in our federal courts class, we talked a lot about the dispute resolution model, the law declaration model, uh, and like Judge Kethledge said last night, I'm firmly persuaded that the dispute resolution model is more consistent with our separation of powers, yet it seems wildly inconsistent with uh, the cert granting power that the Supreme Court has. And so my question is, can you reconcile the Supreme Court's certiorari power to choose which cases they're going to decide with the dispute resolution model? Thank you. Well, since I usually find everything unconstitutional, um, <laughs> it, it, it'll be I actually don't have a problem with that. Um, all the dispute resolution model says is that what courts do when they act is resolve disputes and everything else is incidental to it. It doesn't really say much about how you get those disputes into court. That's a, that's a different question. So I'm, I'm not scandalized by certiorari jurisdiction. I don't know if anyone else is. I, I wouldn't say I've never been really scandalized by it, but it certainly is. It's it's a real question. Thank you so much for raising it. Um, and I wonder how you how all of us on this panel and you would react to, um, you know, those of us who who clerked, know that there are norms that we're supposed to follow that clerks are supposed to follow in recommending whether the Supreme Court will take a case, and it's kind of like you know codified in like Supreme Court handbook, you know, clerk handbooks and things like that. And those have become kind of quasi sources of law. Yeah. Um, and I wonder what you would think about Congress actually codifying those kinds of uh, law rules to say these are the rules that the Supreme Court must follow. 
in deciding whether to hear a case or not. And of course, there's some amount of discretion that's going to be afforded, but here are the, the these are the outlines of what you have to do. And um, there is a lot of room for regulation of the Supreme Court's practices that um, Congress hasn't gone anywhere near, um, in part because these are things that the, the details and the kind of rhythm and the, the kind of feel of it is often not that accessible to people who haven't been on the inside of Supreme Court um, decision making on this score. Um, but I, I myself see no problem with having these things um, regulated to some degree by Congress. It seems to me an example, an extreme example of uh, the Sunsteinian model of one case at a time, and coupled with uh, Professor Lawson's, you know, maybe you have a press release for your decision, maybe you don't. That's often what happens with a cert grant or denial. You know very little, you never have a complete picture. Uh, it's t hard to tease out principles unless you are a member of the guild who has been inside. Uh, and, uh, you know, one might make at least a dotted line to notions of judicial supremacy about the rules that get a case to the top and the, who can't. One way, one way you might describe the system is to say that the American courts run law declaration software on case deciding hardware. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the principles that decide, functionally speaking, how much is the system law declaration and how much is the system case decision depend on, guess what, subconstitutional law. <laughs> Like, like Congress's decision to give the court certiorari jurisdiction, with which I have no problem, and to give them substantial discretion in deciding which cases to take. Man, that's student. Yeah, I, I wanted to add, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say students should know that this whole notion of the court having complete control over its docket is a relatively modern thing. Yeah, that's what I was gonna add. Right, go ahead. About 100 would, years old. I, I was going to add to that, and, and what's super interesting, and this brings in all that Jeannie was telling us about, is that the court members lobbied aggressively for certiorari <laughs> jurisdiction. They wanted discretion. And what I always find particularly amusing when you go back and you look at that testimony is that one of the justices said, oh, if you give us total discretion, we're, gonna, we're still going to decide at least 500 cases a term. <laughs> They, they were they were buried under their mandatory under yeah. their mandatory jurisdiction. Yeah. May I? Um, I can't resist asking these law professors uh, a question to wrap up. That's on a different plane. This has been a very doctrinal, um, very technical panel, uh, and I'm sure you all have learned a lot. Um, but judicial supremacy to perhaps most law students means something a little different, a little more uh, gestalt uh, today. It's uh, by many measures under scrutiny. Notions of judicial supremacy are, no, are under scrutiny by students and professors in ways not seen since perhaps the critical legal studies uh, movement birthed here at HLS, which if you're not up on it, I would commend uh, Professor Gerson's uh, wonderful little film, The Crits. Yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I came to it uh, doing some digging after reading a very provocative article last week or two weeks ago in the New York Times um, um, by Jesse Wegman. Um, it quoted my friend with whom I clerked, um, Leah Littman, who said, teaching con law today is teaching students what law isn't. Um, you know, that sort of view perhaps goes even further than the crits. Um, and, uh, you know, oddly, there is in the premise of that observation, um, this notion that, you know, the law is something and isn't, it's intelligible, ascertainable, um, which, as Professor Mortensen mentioned earlier today, is at odds with where sort of a good law student exam answer might have been when I was in law school, which is, uh, how far can you go with this text? If you take some text and it'll write and you get to a good outcome, that could be a really good exam answer. Um, and so I, I'm just curious what you all think about these notions of judicial supremacy as they're playing out in the legal academy, in the lives of students, the minds of students today. Is this just sort of a different register of the same debates about separation of powers, or is there something different today? I would say there's a, it's um, the same debates in a different register. I would definitely be in that, that camp. Um, I'll tell you one anecdote, I mean, um, in, you know, right after Dobbs came down, um, this 
this is an anecdote that I'm you know, telling you um, because my colleague, Janet Halley, I'm sure would uh, give me permission to say it. Um, a student came to her and was you know, sobbing and in tears and, and was, you know, just felt like the, her belief in the judicial system had been shattered by the decision. And, and Janet looked at her and said, I understand, but for 50 years, people feel, felt equally bad as you're feeling right now um, on the other side. And basically, I, um, I, when I read articles like the one that you, you um, mentioned with um, law professors, liberal law professors saying, I don't know, all of constitutional law is now different and like all of our norms are different and how am I supposed to teach constitutional law the way I, you know, now everything has to change. And I, I, my honest reaction has been, wow, how have you been teaching constitutional law up to this point? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I don't, I don't, you know, if that has to change, I, so, so I, I don't have that view and I don't, I, I can't really relate to it very, very well. Um, but yeah, I, I just, when students are, people are impatient um, these days, I think, that there's, a, there's gonna be a, you know, we have to think in terms of 50 years at a time and not in terms of like overnight, everything's changed. Um, and I think that that's one of the things maybe possibly about this generation that um, that's harder for them to take on board. And if courts are just case deciders, there's not a whole lot for them to be supreme about. You only have the worries about judicial supremacy if you view them as law declarers and see their pronouncements as countermanding anything that anybody else in the system wants to say. I, mean, I, I think that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, I think it's always been fundamentally wrong. It's not, by the way, what Marbury versus Madison was about. Marbury was about whether Congress and the president conclusively bound the courts, not vice versa, not whether the courts could conclusively bind Congress and the president. Um, so I, I think a lot of what you're seeing is the reaction to judicial supremacy is, is a false conception. I think John is right. There's a much more limited understanding of judicial supremacy that if that prevailed, uh, a good chunk of the heat uh, would, would drop away, I think. Am I wrong? Amanda? I think, it, and, and Jeannie, correct me if this is not analogous, but an, an analogy to the story you told, when I teach federal courts, I don't know how many of you have taken it, and, and whether you've uh, worked with Hart and Wexler, I hope you, I hope you do, new edition coming out next year. <laughs> um, uh, but we, you know, I teach Michigan versus Long, and there's this fascinating dissent by Justice Stevens in that case. The case deals with the issue of whether the Michigan Supreme Court uh, got an interpretation of the Fourth Amendment that was pro-defendant correct, and the Supreme Court reverses. And Justice Stevens dissents and says, among other things, I don't think the Supreme Court should be taking cases where state courts overprotect federal constitutional rights. For years, I taught that case, and I would try to drag out, thank you for nodding, he had my class, uh, <laughs> uh, I would try to drag out of my Berkeley students, all of whom reflexively love this dissent. And I admit there are things in it that I find very attractive, but I would say to them as an intellectual exercise, please ask yourself whether you would love this dissent if it was a Second Amendment case. And then this hush comes over the classroom, right? And, and I think what we're having right now as a national experience in debating judicial supremacy is that very debate, but it's much more real. And I think what's important about that is it's forcing each and every one of us who think about these issues to have to try to separate out fundamental principles of separation of powers as we understand them from the merits. And that is really, really hard to do, but actually really important. That is the most optimistic and classically liberal take on our current political judicial moment that I can imagine. And so I think we should <laughs> applaud Professor Tyler and in there. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the panelists.